Teamwork law number 11, the law of the scoreboard. The law of the scoreboard says the team can make adjustments when it knows where it stands. Max Dupree, who wrote some great leadership books, said the first responsibility of a leader is to define reality. And the law of the scoreboard, gang, that's what it really does. The law of the scoreboard, the scoreboard defines what really is. So let me share with you today some statements about the scoreboard. Number one, the scoreboard is essential to understanding. If you go to any sporting event, the way you understand what's happening in the game is by looking at the scoreboard. Isn't that true? It's not how you feel about the game. It's not how long you've been at the game. If you really want to know what's happening, you go to the scoreboard. It is absolutely key to understanding. By the way, that's why when you go to a, an event, a sporting event, that's why the scoreboard is always in a very visible place. Because they realize that the scoreboard must be visible because that's what everybody watches. It's the scoreboard that gives you understanding of how the game is being played, who's winning, who's losing. It just gives you the picture. In fact, the best way I can explain it is this. If you and I went to a sporting event and we came in the second quarter to the event, we wouldn't need to talk to anybody to find out how the game was going. All you have to do is find a scoreboard. Look up the scoreboard, you find out what the score is, you find out what team has the ball, you basically see what kind of progress is being made, if it's a basketball game, how many have fouls on them, how many fouls they have. If it's a football game, what the yardage is, what the time is. The scoreboard is essential to understanding. Statement number two. The scoreboard is essential to evaluating. The scoreboard tells you more than the score. It tells you the condition of the game. It tells you, for example, that maybe one team is a point or two ahead, but maybe their star player is only one foul away from getting out of the game. It, it lets you know the score, but it also helps you to evaluate. It helps the coaches to evaluate decisions that they need to make. By the way, I've always said this, and I believe this. I believe one of the reasons that people like sports so well is because they get instant feedback. Nothing gives you instant feedback like a sporting event. It lets you know immediately how well you did. I mean, now, I'm not a bowler. I mean, I've done bowling before, but I'm not a bowler. I mean, first of all, when I did bowl, I wasn't a bowler. I mean, I'm just not any good at it. I mean, then they, when my middle name was Gutter, it tells you all what you need to know. Now, but here's what I know about bowling. Here's what I know. About, I mean, let's say, let's say you're in a bowling league, and, and, and Friday night's your bowling night, and you've had a hard day at work, and you come home, and you're really tired, and you kind of kick off your shoes, you sit in your easy chair, and you're watching the news, and all of a sudden your wife says, hey, tonight's your bowling night, and you oh my goodness, oh yeah, oh, and you really don't want to go, but you know the team's waiting on you and relying on you, so, so what do you do, you, you, you know, you, you go get that bowling ball out of the closet, you know, and you carry it and put it in your trunk, and you drive across town in the rain, and you pull in the parking lot, pick up the bowling ball, and you go find your buddies, and you put it down in your lane, now here's what I know. You're probably tired, tired starting out. But after about an hour, an hour and a half, you're laughing. You're having a big time. You got energy. Now, where did you get energy? I'm going to tell you exactly where you got the energy. Every time you release that bowl down that alley, within about three seconds, it gives you feedback of how well you did. I mean, you throw the bowl down, you get two pins, you get six pins. But every time you do it, you get immediate feedback. And I know what you're saying. You say, no, 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 I, I don't go bowling for that. I go for the fellowship. Oh, well, you do? <laughs> then here's what I would suggest. The next time you go bowling, carry that 14-pound ball, put it down on that rack, start talking to your friends and say, you know, we're here for fellowship. You know that and I know that. Let's just have the manager remove the pins. I mean, after all, we don't care about the score. Now, I promise you, 
You pick up that bowling ball and let it roll down there about two or three times. Watch it go clear down to the end of that alley and go clunk against the back. And nothing's happened because there's no pins there, and you kind of wait for the ball to get back. It seems like it takes a long time, and, you know, you put your hand over there, you know, get a little air there. And, <laughs> you know, hey, you know, bowl that baby again. Now, here, here's what I know. You do that about a half a dozen times, you'll never pick up the bowling ball and do it again. Why? No feedback. You see, part of the fact of a scoreboard is it lets you know where you are. And here's what I believe. I believe many times people don't keep score in their life. They don't keep score in their family life. They don't keep score in their business life. They don't keep score in their health life. And so therefore, they don't know where they are. So therefore, no wonder it gets mundane. No wonder it gets drab. No wonder you get tired. No wonder you get a little bit worried. You've removed the scoreboard from your life. So scoreboards help us not only in understanding, scoreboards help us in evaluating. Did I do good? Did I not do good? Did I throw a gutter? Did I throw a strike? Okay, okay. Number three, the scoreboard is essential to decision making. You cannot make and I cannot make great decisions without a scoreboard. Let me ask you this question. When does a football coach know when to call a pass play? When the scoreboard says it's third and 17. Hello. When does a manager of a baseball team know when it's time to bring in a relief pitcher? When the bases are loaded. It's in the eighth inning. And the starting pitcher has thrown 160 pitches. He's dying. He needs a healing on his arm. The scoreboard says, hey, you got to change pitchers. When does a basketball coach know when to call a timeout? When all of a sudden the score is not 35 to 35, but it's 60 to 35. And the other team's got the big mo going. He said, wait a minute, timeout. We can't let this get in the way from us. Now, all I'm saying is you've got to have a scoreboard for decision making. And if the team doesn't have to keep score, it's never going to be able to make the right decisions. It's never going to be able to understand where it is. And it's certainly going to be unable to evaluate what the progress has been. Statement number four. And I think this is the most important statement of the five. The scoreboard is essential to adjusting because adjustment is the key to winning. Now, let me, let me, uh, I'll, I'll do five in a second, but let me talk to you about this adjustment process. You see, too many times we have this mistaken idea that as a team, if we, if we do it right, if we have the right game plan, that, that we'll never have to adjust. Let me tell you something. Life is full of adjustments. Life is full of you taking two steps forward and saying, oh my, oh, oh, oh one step backward, and then taking another step and a half. And, well, life is full of adjustments. The person and the team that wins is not the team that doesn't make mistakes. The team that wins is the team that adjusts the quickest. You just show me an organization that fails to adjust quickly. And, and the scoreboard is what allows the team to adjust quickly. The scoreboard is right in front of you saying, it's time to make a change. It's time to make a substitution. It's time to do a different strategy. You see, when the coach goes into the game, the coach at the beginning of the game has a game plan. And the game plan is very important in the beginning of the game. But as the game proceeds, the game plan gets a lot less important and the scoreboard begins to be the dominating influence because it tells you exactly where you are. About three years ago, I wrote a book called Failing Forward. That's a book about failure. It's a book about adjustments, what we're talking about here. In fact, when I was on Good Morning America and I was being interviewed on the book, and they asked me, they said, um, where did you do the research? on the book, Failing Forward. <laughs> I did what you, I just started laughing. I said, it's the only book I've ever written that I didn't have to do research on. <laughs> I mean, I didn't have to go to the library. I didn't have to go in the, the web page. I didn't have to do anything. All I had to do is stop long enough to reflect about my life. Because failure for me has been a spiritual gift. <laughs> now, it may not be your gift, but it's, it's my gift. I, I excel. <laughs> I excel in failure. I just, I've always been good at this. And the thesis of the book is very simple. The major difference between average people and achieving people is their perception of and their response to failure. In other words, how I see failure going in and how I respond to failure coming out 
is going to determine my success. Not how big was the failure, how often was the failure, how dark was the failure, how disturbing was the failure. No, 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 no. none of that stuff. It's my perception of and my response to failure that's going to determine whether I'm going to be able to overcome it, if I'm going to be able to fail forward. Now, very simply, that's a book about adjustments. The whole thesis of the book basically says, you fail, I fail, we all fail. Now, let me take a little poll in the studio. How many of you have failed at least one time <laughs> today? Sure. Okay. The question is not, are you going to fail? That's not the question. That's why I'm always amazed that people say, well, I don't think I'd try that. I think you might fail. Well, so? What's new? The question is not, are you going to fail? The question is, how quickly do you adjust? The question is not, are you going to fall down? We all fall down. In fact, one of the things I teach is the fact that when you fall, while you're down there, pick something up. <laughs> I mean, you're already down there. Isn't that right? You know, clean the floor. I mean, you don't get down there all the time. Do something worthwhile. You all right? And the reason I say that is because our fear of failure and our embarrassment of failure causes us many times not to learn from our mistakes. We're so desirous for people not to see us make stupid mistakes. Then we get up as quick as we, we fall down. We get up as quick as we can. We kind of we fasten our jacket. We say, boy, I, I don't think anybody saw me. I don't think, I don't, I don't, I don't think anybody saw me. And everybody in the room says, did you see Maxwell fall flat on his face? Okay. You're going to fall. You're going to fail. The law of the scoreboard says getting behind in a game doesn't make you lose the game. What makes you lose the game is the failure to make changes necessary. See, the scoreboard is saying you're losing because you're not doing something correctly. Now, the quicker I adjust to that, the quicker I see that scoreboard and say, oh my goodness, I have to change, I have to do something different, the quicker I see that and make the adjustments, the more successful I'm going to be. So the law of the scoreboard, what it does is it allows the team to make adjustments quickly. By the way, would it not be an ignorant coach to look at the scoreboard and see that his or her team was losing and basically say, I'm going to ignore the scoreboard? Uh, wouldn't it be, hey, what would you think of a coach that looked up the scoreboard and didn't like what it said and said, because I don't like what it says, I refuse to look at that anymore. Yet I know all kind of people, I know all kind of teams. That because they don't like the message of the scoreboard, they refuse to look at it. As if that will make it better. Statement number five about the scoreboard. The scoreboard is essential to winning. The scoreboard is essential to winning. It helps you win. Classic example of this. Let me ask you a question. I'll bet some of you will know this. Sports fans will know this. When does a football team score the most points in a game? Last two minutes. You're exactly right. The last two minutes. The last two minutes of the half, the last two minutes of the game. You know why that's when a football team scores the most points? Because they realize there's not much time left. And all of a sudden, they take risk and they do all kinds of things. The scoreboard basically says, you don't have much time. What I'm saying is that if we'll look at the scoreboard, for some of us, the scoreboard of life, it'll help create within us a sense of urgency as a person or as a team to reach our potential as quickly as we can. Um, let me give a personal illustration here in closing out the law of the scoreboard. On December the 18th, 1998, I had a heart attack. This was a major scoreboard wake-up call. I mean, up until that time, because I have always, I've always been healthy. 
In my 25 years of pastoring, I never missed a Sunday in the pulpit because of sickness. So I've always been a healthy person. And, 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 and because I assumed a lot of things about my health, I didn't take care of myself. And so one day I wake up and I've had a heart attack. Close call, God was good, good doctors, life spared. Three days later, I'm there about to ready to release me. And so my heart doctor is going to come in and talk to me. And I know this is a very important talk. In fact, I've been writing questions, things I want to ask, <coughs> things I know are going to be very important to me. And I've kept my list. And he comes in and I begin, I say, do you mind if I ask some questions? He says, no. He says, I have some things to share with you. And so I ask questions about life and longevity and, and could I have the normal life and the whole process. And he gave me the answers and those things. And then he said, but Johnny said, I want you to understand it's basically conditioned on two things. I said, what's that? He said, one is exercise, and two is proper food diet. Now, he looked at me and realized that I had flunked both of those. <laughs> and he said, I want you to go home, and I want you to start exercising every day. Not five days a week, seven days a week. And so, I, you know, I'm sitting on the edge of bed, and I got my legal pad out there, and I'm writing it down. I have my wife Margaret there so she can make sure we catch everything it says and you know, exercise every day. And I said, okay. I said, I got that one. I'll do that. When he looks at me, he said, I doubt if you will. So what do you mean? He said, well, he said, I do this every day with heart patients. I tell them to go home and exercise. And he said, my finding is 80% of them go home and for six months they exercise and then they give it up. So he said, when you tell me you'll exercise every day, he said, I doubt that. He says, your intentions are good, but he said, I doubt if you have the discipline to follow through on that. He said, the second thing is you need to change your eating habits. And I said, what do you mean by that? He said, well, he said, you need to quit eating things like chocolate and peanut butter and he gave me all this fat stuff. Basically, he took away my food groups. <laughs> And I wrote the list down and I said, well, doctor, I said, uh, I'll go home and change my eating habits. And again, he looked at me and said, I doubt that. He said, I do this every day. And he said, everybody tells me the same thing, they'll do it. But he said 80% of the people that are heart patients within six months, they're back to the old diet that got them into the place of the heart attack the first time. And then he said to me, in all likelihood, I'll see you again. He said, you were fortunate this time you lived. Remember, half of the people who have heart attacks don't get this opportunity. Now, very simply, that was a scoreboard. And I was losing. Totally, radically changed my life. I had a very stressful, difficult leadership day at Enjoy yesterday. And I finally get home late evening, knowing I got today going before me, emotionally wiped out and tired. So I sit down and I talk with Margaret for probably 45 minutes. And at 9.15 last night, out to the pool I go for 35 minutes of water aerobics. You see, I do it every day. Because the scoreboard says, John, exercise every day or you're in trouble. Now. What I'm saying to you, whether it's diet or exercise, you need to have a scoreboard. And the scoreboard basically says I'm winning or the scoreboard says I'm losing. I'm doing well or I'm not doing well. And you need to have a scoreboard for your family life. You need to have a scoreboard, I think, for your spiritual life. You need to have a scoreboard for your health life. You need to have a scoreboard for your business life. But you've got to have the scoreboard because the scoreboard basically gives you a picture of where you are. And basically the scoreboard, the scoreboard doesn't give you victory. The scoreboard just tells you what you've got to do to win. And the law of the scoreboard says, very simply, that a team can make adjustments when it knows where it stands. So in every area of your life, I encourage you as a leader and as a fellow team member, know where you stand. I'm winning. I'm losing. I'm starting to lose. I'm coming back. Know where you stand. Because if you don't know where you stand, you have no idea where to start.
and make the progress you want to make. It's the law of the scoreboard.